the end of this uh, uh, session, we will have all the uh, queries that, uh, that can be addressed. So the first speaker is uh, Dr. Shivani. She is an associate professor in uh, uh, Patna, in uh, Indira Gandhi Eye Hospital, and a prolific VR surgeon. And she'll be speaking to us on the indica indications of indirect ophthalmoscopy. Why is it so important, and what are the uses of it? On to you, Dr. Shivani. Thank you, ma'am, for the introduction. And at the outset, I, I would like to thank uh, Pooja, ma'am, for uh, giving me a chance uh, in this IC. So uh, basically, uh, what are the indications of indirect ophthalmoscopy and why is it so important? So a very brief history. It was first designed in 1852, which was monoocular. And uh, Charles Sheepings is considered as the modern, of, uh, mod, uh, modern uh, binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. So this is a very familiar table which we have uh, all uh, seen uh, from our uh, UG days, uh, which enumerates the differences between direct and indirect op ophthalmoscope. So uh, we have also got a very s uh, feature of small pupil which allows us to examine uh, when the pupils are poorly dilated or undilated, uh, which is facilitated by a small lever and uh, which will be discussed in uh, detail later on. So what are the common indications? So uh, we uh, all uh, know there are common retinal degenerations ranging from lapis degeneration, snail track, snowflake, PSDs, white without pressure, retinal hole, retinoschisis, meridional folds, and without white with pressure. So why are these retinal degenerations important and why do we need to screen them? There are certain uh, retinal degenerations which predispose to regmatogenous retinal detachment, which are retinal hole or tear that is degeneration, snail track or degeneration, retinoschisis, white without pressure, and uh, when the meridional folds are associated with a retinal hole at its apex. And there are certain retinal degenerations which do not predispose uh, uh, to re regmatogenous retinal detachment, like snowflake degeneration, sparing snow degeneration, honeycomb, white, white with pressure, or meridional folds. So this is an example of lattice degeneration uh, we can see the lattice degeneration in the superior nasal quadrant in the left side. Uh, this is an example of snail track degeneration over in the temporal quadrant to the left side. And the, these uh, whitish uh, uh, yellowish spots which we see in the tem uh, per temporal periphery are indicative of snowflake de degenerations. This is an example of a atrophic retinal hole in the uh, impero uh, temporal quadrant. And uh, we can see there are no active uh, vitroretinal fraction, so we label it as a atrophic retinal hole. Similarly, we can see the uh, yellowish uh, white patches over here associated with uh, pigmentation, indicative of paving stone degenerations. Similarly, we can have white with, uh, without pressure, uh, and uh, the which we can uh, mistake for a flat retinal hole. Retinoschisis is also a very important uh, finding which we need to look in at the indir uh, indirect ophthalmoscope. Uh, so whenever we see a kind of uh, uh, cystoid uh, or uh, uh, this kind of fluid in the macula, we need to examine the periphery to look for uh, excellent uh, juvenile retinoschisis, especially in young children. So this is an example of a meridional fold associated with a hole at the apex. There are certain uncommon ones like bills, cysts, pearls, and honeycombs. So they can be certain case scenarios also. If a young female presents with a com complaint of sudden onset of floaters, there can be two scenarios, a normal segment examination with no anterior vitreous cells and a normal sen anterior segment examination with anterior vitreous cells. So how does both the scenarios differ? So when we have got a normal segment examination with no anterior vitreous cells, we need to look for uh, retinal breaks or uh, tears which have led to the dispersion of the R2 pigments leading to uh, floaters. And when we have uh, anterior vitreous cells, we have to uh, look specifically for intermediate uveitis and indent and see for snow banking and uh, snowball. Uh, we have to screen patients with myopia, which may be associated with uh, many uh, myopic findings like uh, myopic macular degeneration, cofist phylomas, android streaks, and uh, a very important role is in the patients who have sustained trauma, and the trauma, it can range from posterior, uh, posterior uh, findings to the peripheral uh, findings. Like we can see a uh, coral rupture over here and a circumferential coral rupture over here. These are uh, findings of retinitis pleopatoria, and uh, which can be associated with high-speed uh, velocity injuries. 
This is an example of a uh, anterior uh, vitreous base aversion, which is a very pathognomic of uh, trauma. You can see dialysis over here, which is not associated with SRF, so uh, 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 laser, uh, uh, laser immune uh, pneumopexy has been uh, retinopexy has been done. So uh, when we look uh, for findings like ERM, we specifically need to examine the periphery to look for the cause of ERM. Uh, ERM can be a manifestation of a disease elsewhere, which has led to intense inflammatory activity. Like in this uh, case, we will see the shearing in the peripheral uh, uh, vessels, which has led to ERM formation. So uh, when we, whenever we get a finding, we need to look for etiology, not just spatially, but also uh, anteriorly in the uh, vitreous. In cases of diabetic retinopathy, we will need to look for microvascular changes, the PVR changes, proliferative changes, and the traction components, which are associated with uh, the DR. But in AMD and PCV, we are increasingly getting uh, uh, cases of peripheral uh, varieties, so we need to screen for them also. In cases of retinal vascular disorders, we need to look for the extent, uh, especially in cases of uh, um, occlusions, we need to look for the causes of embolus and where the embolus has traveled. And in uh, venous fusion, we look for the extent of the hemorrhages to determine the uh, uh, extent of damage which is done. The CSCR and retinal detachment, we do not go for examination in the periphery. Sometimes on 90-day examination, people may confuse C, uh, uh, retinal detachment with CSCR. We need to dilate every patient and see for CSCR. Also, we have to look for uh, causes of CSCR, if it is associated by little CSCR, uh, to look for causes, are there any inflammatory causes which has incited uh, a serous detachment. Uh, retinal detachment is very important to look for uh, breaks, active breaks, and the uh, degree of and the grade of PVR changes, and uh, whether we have to go for uh, uh, buckling or we have to go for vitrectomy. So these all modalities of treatment will be uh, confirmed on uh, a meticulous indirect uh, ophthalmoscopic examination. Especially in cases of uveitis, where we get vitreous haze, it is very important uh, that we uh, examine it. We have to look for ERMs, we have to look for granulomas and characteristic uveitic occlusions. We have to specifically uh, see peripheral vascular sheathing, and we have to rule out snow bankings and snowballs. In cases of uh, uh, prior to cataract surgery and in cases of retinal detachment, we have to have a very good uh, pre op examination. In par, uh, during when we do scleral buckling, it's very important that we know uh, in the ophthalmoscopy because without that, uh, we won't be able to do uh, buckling. In cases of pneumatic retinopexy, before, go, before we go in for a cryo, we need to locate it and we ha have to see wh where we have kept the probe, where we are uh, uh, freezing the uh, 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 our break. In cases of ocular tumors, we need to determine the uh, location, size of the ocular tumors. Uh, this also uh, plays a very important uh, role in pediatric vascular disorders like uh, uh, ROP, where we have to determine whether it is a demarcation line. It's just a demarcation line, or it is associated with a red, or it is associated with a neovascular uh, fronts leading to stage three. Where, uh, whether it is associated with uh, retinal detachment, stage 4, and this is a very classical picture of aggressive ROP. In cases of Coats disease, we have to look for exudations, and also we have to look for telangiectasias. stevias. In cases of retinoblastoma, we need to uh, determine the size, location, and the number of the tumors. And this is a case of uh, juvenile excellent uh, retinocytes where a young uh, male child had uh, presented with a uh, edema in the uh, posterior uh, bone, and we had uh, retinocytes in the periphery. A uh, very brief uh, about non-contact slit lamp biomicroscopy, where uh, we uh, use uh, lens power ranging from 60 diopters to 90 diopters. Depending on the magnification of the slit lamp, we have the magnification there. And it is a very important tool for macular lesions. And obviously, we had a new indication during our uh, COVID era, where we uh, used IO for uh, evaluation. So to conclude, eye, eye examination is never complete without a meticulous indirect ophthalmoscope. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shivani. That was a very excellent presentation. So now that we know what are the indications of indirect ophthalmoscopy and what cases uh, we have to do an indirect, let's go on to study the optics, how, how the indirect ophthalmoscope works. Because if you don't know how the machine works, 
you will never be proliferant prolific in, in doing the technique. So to be proficient in doing endithophthalmoscopy, we should know the different parts of the endithophthalmoscope first. And uh, for that, we have invited Dr. Abhishek Kedia, who is a prolific VR surgeon in uh, Patna and Ara. And he'll be speaking to us about the optics of endithophthalmoscope. Thank you, Dr. Pooja, for making me part of this IC. And uh, it's very important to know the machine on which you're working. So it definitely sounds boring. But it's not so very, we just need to know a few, few important points uh, which I have tried to simplify and let's look into it. Uh, okay. So uh, this is an indirect ophthalmoscope and Just trying to bring the pointer. So uh, this is the illuminator, uh, which is the light giving part to the examination. And this is the headband. So this whole thing is headband, which has got knots on the top and on the sides so that you can adjust the size according to your head. And so the main thing is this illumination, which has got various uh, knots and apertures so that uh, we can change the light and we can move the beam like this one. We can, with this help of this, we can move the beam up and down. And here they are knots which you can use to change the color and, and the size of the beam. And uh, on the bottom we have uh, aperture which we can reduce. So suppose a patient is having small people, then you need to reduce it to small people. And if it's the well dilated, then you need to make it to a slightly larger size. So it was introduced by Nagel in 1864. The principle is nothing, it's just we make the eye highly myopic by placing a high power convex lens in front of the eye so that we get a real inverted and laterally reversed image. So it's real inverted and laterally reversed. And the image is formed close to the principal focus of the lens between the lens and the observer. And this is called indirect because we are observing the fundus through a condensing lens, not in observing it direct. Now coming to the very important principle, Gullstrand's principle. This is very important to have a, a uh, to get a good view. So this principle is nothing. It just says that the viewing beam and the emulating beam that should be separate. It should coincide on the retina, but it's the illuminating beam goes through the pupil, cornea pupil, and then transfer uh, travels through the lens and then gets focused on the retina. The same beam gets refracted back travels through the lens, the pupil, and comes back to the observer's view. But these two should be separate. If they, they coincide, then it's very difficult to get uh, view and you get a lot of reflection. So they should coincide on the retina, but they should not overlap. And the binocularity is achieved by the help of prism and mirrors. So the observer's interpupillary distance, which is approximately 60 millimeter, is reduced to 50 15 millimeter by the prisms and mirrors. The advantages of indirect ophthalmoscope, it gives stereopsis. The field of view is larger as compared to the 90D or 78D biomicroscopy. The illumination is bright. So, uh, and there is minimum peripheral view distortion if you do it properly. And we can have a complete eye examination with the help of scalar indentation. And it's independent of patient refractive error or moderate media obfuscation. So this is the uh, 20 diopter lens. So the important thing to keep in mind is that when we are examining the patient, the silver lining on the lens should be facing the patient's eye. It should not be on the other side. So uh, this is the examiner doing uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy. So as soon as you put it on the head, adjust all the settings, and then you put the light on the patient's eye 
and then just bring the uh, lens in, in front of the eye and then just, just ba bend backwards and then adjust the light accordingly so that it goes directly into the eye so you get a good view. These are the various lenses which you can use. So 14 diopter gives a magnification of 3.8 times. The 20 diopter gives a magnification of three times and the 20 30 diopter gives a magnification of 2.1 times. Uh, this is a small video to make things uh, revise and just to for a better understanding how we examine. I'll just show how you have to fix the neck and how you proceed. So first you fix the head case. You have two knobs, one at the eye and one up. This basically fix the adjust. And once it is properly adjusted, then you focus the beam on the ball or on your finger. And after this you have to adjust the IPD so you can have good balance energy. So you close one with your uh, one eye and see whether this beam is in the center of this uh, viewing system. I will, I will close the other eye and again repeat the same thing. After this, you open both your eyes and just adjust your IPD properly. So with this, then you start the, the procedure. So now, before starting the procedure and demonstrating how you do the diaphanoscopy, I will just briefly go through the optics of this. So the basic concept, whole concept of indirect endoscope is you have to make the eye myopic by placing a high power convex lens that is a condensing lens in front of the patient's eye and this result in seeing a fundus image which is really inverted so since it is the indirect viewing of the uh, fundus through the condensing lens so we call it indirect otoscopy and while we see the patient fundus one very important principle comes into play that is called Goldstrand principle so what is Goldstrand principle the whole principle says that the inverting beam, that the beam which passes from this indirect optoscope, this uh, inverting beam, passes through the cornea, pupillary, apartheid and lenses and goes on the retina and from there it reflects back and comes through the same pathway that, that is uh, lens, pupillary, apartheid and cornea. While going and coming out, both stays parallel, they don't coincide because if they coincide, then there will be scattering and reflection and we won't, are, won't be able to see the fundus image. So whole concept is they will lie parallel and meet only at the fundus. So that we can see the image. And then when we place the condensed lens, so this image which is coming from the fundus gets focused on somewhat near the principal focus of the condensing lens, which is between the observer eye and the condensing lens. So this is the basic principle of indirect optoscope. So to start the, how you start basic procedure, you need a paper, this diagram. This is basically for drawing the diagram. Whatever you see, you just note, note it down here. Now, this paper, you place it beside the patient head, or just here, and you have to remember that 12 o'clock position, it's marked here, 12. It should be facing towards this 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock towards this 6 o'clock. The whole concept is when you see the patient, I suppose when you see the patient, this is done so that he can, because with bright light, he won't be able to see his finger, but he will have this spatial orientation of his finger so he can focus it properly. And when you see this patient is focusing there and you place the condensing lens, now the concept is whenever you place, use this lens. This plays as the fulcrum of the fiber. This, with this, you move your lens. You have to hold your lens like this, and this finger acts as a fiber or fulcrum. And with this, you can move up and down, down near to eye and far away from the eye for a proper focusing. And you ask the patient to look in the desired direction. You just ask him to look to this finger, and then you focus on his eye. Now, whatever you see, the basic concept is. Whatever you see, what you see near to you, you draw on this fundus picture. Since you are seeing this 
This is the 5 o'clock position. We are seeing the 5 o'clock position. So you just see where is the 5 o'clock position. And whatever you see near to you, draw near to you. And what is far out from you, draw it far out from yourself. When you place it properly, you will see it is properly aligned. We won't have any confusion of this real inverted whether it is in the 6 o'clock position or 12 o'clock position. Just you remember this is 5 o'clock position you are seeing. This is 3 o'clock position. So you come on 3 o'clock position. This is 12 o'clock position. So you concentrate on 12 o'clock position. Whatever you see in 12 o'clock position, whatever you are seeing far off from yourself, draw it far off in the diagram. Whatever is near, draw it near. So this way you complete the whole examination. So hope I am clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I think that video must have made the optics and the examination technique uh, uh, more clearer to you. Uh, any questions? I think we'll take the questions at the end. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Bishek, for your uh, wonderful presentation and excellent video, which has made uh, things for me quite simple. So uh, now I'll be starting with my uh, talk on the technique of indirect ophthalmoscopy. Thank you, ma'am. So going on to the technique of indirect ophthalmoscopy, uh, wonderful video has been shown to you. So I just go through the steps one by one to make things more clearer. So the parts of indirect ophthalmoscope have been already ex nicely explained to you all. Now the most important thing in doing indirect ophthalmoscopy is how to wear the indirect ophthalmoscope. Because if you are not comfortable with the instrument, you will never be able to spend time in documenting everything. So the correct positioning and adjustment of the bio headset is very important. There are two uh, knobs, the uh, top knob and the back knob, and that has to be adjusted snugly uh, fitting the head, but not too tight or not too loose. Because you have to remember that the next five minutes you have to spend in examining the posterior pole, the periphery of the uh, fundus, uh, retina, etc. This is the rheostat, which shows the intensity of illumination. The uh, intensity should be moderate. It should never be too bright because that will cause blinding and the patient will never be comfortable. There will be squeezing, uh, uncomfortable moments and the um, uh, crucial documents uh, of the fundus will be left behind. So it should be moderate, which makes the patient uh, uh, comfortable and you also. This is how I'm adjusting it. This is the rheostat. Now here is the lever on the uh, uh, bottom uh, uh, part of the slide which can be moved to converge the illumination and the viewing beams so that stereopsis can be achieved in small pupils. So you, now you remember what Dr. Bishek was telling you about the Gulf Strands principle. So this is what it is, the illuminating beam on the top and the two viewing beams. And they are all have to be, um, uh, uh, you know, they have to fo uh, uh, focus pinpoint on the retina for you to get a good, good image. So this uh, lever helps in doing so. Now the adjustment knob where you can adjust the height and the angulation of the optics. This is adjusting the interpupillary diameter. There is a, a knob below which you can just move just like you do in the operating microscope. The interpupillary diameter will help you to uh, 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 check your IPD. And then you have the important filters, the red, red free, the yellow and the blue filters. The red free filter blocks the structures below the RP and enhances the contrast of the retinal blood vessels and the hemorrhages. It helps in the CD assessment ratio, and it also helps to identify the nerve fiber layer. What does the blue filter do? It can enhance the reflectivity of the optic distribution, and it is for use in fluorescent angiography also. The yellow filter reduces the UV exposure. So this is the spot size. On the other side, you have the spot size, where you can choose the spot size. Sometimes the pupil is very small, so, so the spot size has to be reduced. Now the most important thing is centering. How do we do the centering? The centering is done uh, against the 
foot, uh, the tip of the thumb, which is outstretched. So you have to um, uh, angulate the knob so that the, uh, uh, the the illuminating beam is focusing on the top of your thumb, the tip of the thumb. Now, how do we start the endithalamoscope? First, make sure that the room is darkened. Don't be in a hurry. The room should be darkened. The patient's pupil should be fully dilated and the examiner should be partially dark, dark adapted. The fundus chart is clipped on a rigid board that rests on the patient's chest. It is oriented upside down where 12 o'clock uh, uh, is facing towards the patient's feet and 6 o'clock is towards the chin. So when we were fellows in Shankar Netale, we had two, three things in our mind. Firstly, direct ophthalmoscopes were banned. We could only use the indirect ophthalmoscope. Secondly, the room had to be ha having uh, no, very low intensity. The light had to be dimmed or switched off. The patient should be comfortable. The pupils should be fully uh, dilated. The, there sh there sh uh, should be space between your uh, table where the patient is lying and the wall so that you can move all across the, all around the patient. So this is very important. And the other thing is we, we had to have color pencils in our coat pockets with the fundus chart. Without the fundus chart, indirect ophthalmoscopy has no meaning. What instruction do we give to the patient? Just you should we just start like that or should we instruct the patient? You have to tell the patient in their colloquial language that the fellow eye has to be kept open. Sometimes it's difficult. So like uh, Dr. Bishek so nicely said, you have to uh, ask the patient to look in the different cardinal directions of gaze or use their thumb for fixation. Always the fellow eye has to be open because you have to remember that otherwise the Bell's phenomenon comes into force and uh, the eye squeeze shut. Folding of the lens also has been explained. I'll just go through it again. The condensing lens is held between the thumb and the index finger and the free fingers are placed on the patient's face to stabilize the lens and retract the lid. So always remember that when you're doing indirect ophthalmoscopy, the three fingers add as, as, as the fulcrum and they always have to rest on the chin. You cannot be holding the lens and uh, keep your hand in the air. Then you will not get the image. So the three fingers have to be uh, placed firmly on the patient's face and the th only these two fingers like that move up and down. The light beam should be central, illuminating the pupil completely. Slowly raise the lens while the pupil and the red reflex fills the lens view. This is again important. Again, I'm repeating it. Kalstrans principle, that is the image, the pupillary space and the fundus of the patient's eye. Your condensing lens and the indirect ophthalmoscope all has to be in the same line. If the view goes black or appears inverted, you have moved too far away from the eye. This is the focal lens. Uh, the uh, uh, first one is, uh, you know, it is too, uh, it is correct. The uh, center one is too high up and the third one is too closely fit, uh, uh, you know, uh, placed on the face. Uh, once we've examined the uh, posterior pole, how do we examine the periphery? The examiner always stands at the opposite end of the meridian to be examined. So to examine the six o'clock, the examiner is standing at 12 o'clock and the patient is gazing downward. The most important query that the postgraduates have is, ma'am, uh, how do we know which uh, quadrant we are actually seeing when we are doing the indirect ophthalmoscopy? The quadrant which is in view is the one which you are examining. So if, if, you are, if the patient is looking down and you are seeing the inferior retinal periphery, it is actually the inferior retinal periphery. It is not the superior periphery. It is actually what you are seeing, only that the image is uh, real and inverted. Do you understand? So if you are seeing the superior periphery, actually it is the superior periphery, only that the things are right is left and left is right. Okay, so this is one very important thing that you have to understand. And uh, when you are uh, charting, then you have to stand at the opposite side and as Dr. Abhishek uh, nicely said, the 12 o'clock has to be towards the foot and the 6 o'clock towards the chin so that when you document it, if it is actually in the oppo opposite quadrant because you are, doing, uh, you are seeing something there and you, are, and you are documenting it towards you. So what happens is that the when, when you invert the chart, then it comes in the right perspective. Okay, so is that clear? So this is examination of the posterior pole including the disc and macula as I have said. This is examination the, of the inferior periphery. What did I say? The patient is looking downwards and you are standing in the 180 degree opposite quadrant. 
and then this is the superior periphery again the patient is looking in the same quadrant which you want to examine the superior retinal periphery and you are standing 180 degree opposite and this is like a bharat natyam you have to go all around the patient tilting your head properly so that uh, because if i was standing vertically straight i would not get this image of the periphery especially so this is the documentation uh technique of sterile indentation once you have mastered the indirect ophthalmoscopy then only uh, you go on to sterile indentation what what are the advantages it offers a clear view of the structures in the retinal periphery that is the ora serrata posterior border of the ciliary processes it permits a kinetic examination allowing a stereoscopic view uh, i'll go through this slide and then i will explain it with the help of the picture in the next slide the thimble is placed in the index finger the blunt tip of the depressor is placed on the skin of the eyelid over the area of sclera to be indented now if you examining the upper fundus periphery eyelids have to be closed the depressor tip is applied to the upper lid at the upper edge of the tarsus and when the patient opens the lid and looks up the tip of the depressor slides easily under the orbital margin and the depressor should be tangential to the globe so this is i will now explain what i had written in the slide now here we are wanting to examine the inferior retinal periphery of the patient so first you apply the thimble of the depressor in the inferior retinal periphery jo aapko dekhna hai you have you are seeing the inferior periphery the thimble all will also will be in the same quadrant but what is the patient doing the patient is looking up okay now as soon as you do, do this in uh, keep this in position now slowly ask the patient to look down and then you are you will see that like butter the uh, the thimble will move back uh, against the inferior tarsus and you can easily see the inferior uh, structures so the, the general concept is that scleral indentation is very painful ma'am it's not painful if you do it correctly it it is a very simple procedure so this is the advantages uh, uh, kamsky or other books have this slide uh, this is again a repetition uh, 20 dd is most commonly used and with the 3x magnification condensing lenses the, the general concept is higher power have lesser magnification but a bigger field of view and this slide everyone knows so properly done indirect saves the patient's eye saves your practice practice and you can sleep well this uh, i'll not go through this video because it's already been covered can i have the next next slide please the next slide because i think this is the most important okay. part of the sure. uh, course the examination any uh, any queries even basic questions if you have because we have a uh, limited audience here which can be more interactive sometimes it is beneficial so if at all you all can come in front whoever is interested and uh, any questions you have that come to your mind feel free to ask that i find difficult yeah so one thing is the whenever you doing a intraoperative intraoperative you want, you want to ask uh, so you you are doing a buccal procedure or you are doing a vitrectomy yeah i think it's not uh, you are covering that topic uh, to intraoperative no no, no no okay i think i'm just going going through the difficulties now so right. it's okay okay so in that case uh, if you are doing buckle then it is very simple because you have already opened up all the quadrants and uh, you, you have done it so intraoperative while doing vitrectomy there is a difficulty but uh, again what you have to take is the uh, you, you you generally if we are doing a vitrectomy we see the fundus through the your viewing system only rather than changing to the indirect, indirect ophthalmoscope and then uh, doing the depression so while doing uh, viewing through the system you just have to take your cotton tip applicator and uh, in the part that you have to see you have to just depress it and uh, you have to move your uh, microscope towards that area and then you'll be able to see it you have to take care that it the tip does not go too deep because if you go too deep you will not be seeing the ora itself you will be seeing the deeper structures only so it has to be uh, positioned rightly uh, thoda anteriorly to have a good view of the aura and then you ask your assistant to uh, move your 
tip, uh, just rotate the tip from five o'clock to six o'clock to seven o'clock, and uh, that way you can examine the whole of the peripheral aura. Doing an indirect ophthalmoscope, uh, if you have difficulty in scleral indentation, one of the most common causes is you are not able to see the periphery, is that your uh, indenter is not in the same line. What happens is uh, when you have to get a good view of indentation, your eyes, the lens, the patient's area that has to be examined and the indenter has to be in the same line. Only then you will be able to see uh, what you want to see. Otherwise, you will not be able to see. So you, if you will be depressing sideways, sometimes the indenter slips sideways. It, it happens very commonly. Uh, even with experienced hands also, it, it happens. So you have to be, if you are not seeing what you want to see, it means that it is not in the same line. Just check it again and come to the same line and then you will be able to see. I think uh, that answers the question. So is it uh, like if patient is not cooperative and not looking in the manner ma'am so like ask us to see, yeah. then also you are able to see peripheral or there will be some limitation if patient is not cooperative? Yeah, there'll be, there will be some limitation. The you can uh, put some dilator drops, oh sorry, uh, lubricant drops to just aid in uh, being the patient cooperative. You can decrease the light if you are possible. Or nowadays what we sometimes do is we use a red free uh, filter and then examine the periphery sometimes that also helps. The patient becomes a little bit cooperative in that, in that situation also. And sometimes we even, uh, if, if, if we have to do, if we very uh, badly need to do indentation and uh, the patient is still not cooperating, sometimes we used to, nowadays we don't because as you master the technique, it becomes unnecessary. Earlier in when we were doing a residency days and we absolutely needed the indirect ophthalmoscopy with indentation to be done, we used to dip, uh, even give some facial block in those eyes to get them done so that it does not squeeze the eyes. Right, thank sir. you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Okay, thanks so much. So one I or two things I, I like to add, add to okay, this. So mm -hmm. uh, for this in the okay, technique. For the technique. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one thing is yeah, when you are wearing an indirect ophthalmoscope, it, it, uh, what I feel is the indirect ophthalmoscope is the crown on an ophthalmologist's head. And everybody should be wearing it, right? And whenever you're wearing it, now the weight of the indirect should be at the top of your head. Right, it should not be on this. So you should not tighten it from this side, but the it should be the weight should be carried by the top of the head because if it is not at the top of the head and you are tightening you with the band uh, from the side, do an indirect ophthalmoscopy. They'll you'll be having a lot of headache after that. So uh, the indirect should be resting on your top of your head. That is very important, right? And when you are examining, it should not touch your nose. Right, because uh, whenever it touches your nose, you are getting going to have that nasal burns over here. Right, so one thing in in, the in then dark room is absolutely uh, very necessary because then you get a better view of the thing. Uh, types of lenses we had covered, no? Yeah. Yes, that is um, yeah. The most commonly used is twenty diopters, but you can sometimes for children you use the thirty diopter lenses, and even for if you are examining at the uh, macular lesions you want, you can uh, use the 18 adapter lens also. Sometimes that is that can be used. Then uh, the history of uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy. See, indirect ophthalmoscopy is such an important investigation. Uh, uh, there is an, there has only been one Nobel Prize awarded in the field of ophthalmology, right? And that is for invention of indirect ophthalmoscope. Uh, to Gulstrand, right? He got the Nobel Prize for the invention of indirect ophthalmoscope. So, you see how the how much the importance of this uh, investigation is, right? Yeah. So I move on. Yeah. Yes. That, that plus thirteen plus fourteen diopters are also available. That are but for using the plus fourteen diopter, there's a limitation that uh, you have to uh, hold it very far away from the eye and sometimes it becomes difficult and pupil needs to be widely dilated for using the 14 diopter lens. Yeah, uh, or you can, there is 2.2 also, which is very used very commonly. It gives you both the central as well as the peripheral images very clearly. Should we, uh, should we do the documentation on your talks now and then go on to the difficult No, you, you carry on with the fundus round, I think. On with the fundus round? Yeah. Okay, so I'll just uh, run through uh, about four or five slides I have on the difficulties and then we'll go on to the documentation as the last topic. 
before sir speaks on his uh, topic. So uh, what are the difficulties in doing endophthalmoscopy? It is, is it just a piece of cake or are there some difficulties? So uh, there are basically four headings. This topic was supposed to be discussed by uh, Dr. Saurav Sinha from uh, Netra Ram Kol Kolkata, but unfortunately he's not been able to join us. So there are four, basically four headings, a poor doctor, a poor patient, poor instrumentation, or clinical situation. What is the meaning of a poor doctor? Of course, uh, a doctor who is not financially, uh, it doesn't mean that he is financially poor. It means a doctor who is not well versed with this technique. A poor patient is of course an uncooperative patient or a pediatric patient. So a poor, poor doctor, as I said, not well trained or conversant, who has lack of patience, lack of motivation, and lack of time. Time is very important when you're doing indirect ophthalmoscopy. Uh, this is a very nice picture of a, uh, a small baby lying perfectly flat and the, doc the uh, uh, doctor is doing the procedure. This is not so in real life. The child will be moving his arms and legs, he'll be crying, he'll be yelling, the doctor will be also moving here and there. So some uh, uh, small children of course are very uncooperative. Very elderly patient, hard of hearing, could also not be able to follow your instructions. Apprehensive patient, a mentally challenged patient or if there is communication gap, if, if you're doing your fellowship in Karnataka and you don't know uh, their local language, you may have a problem. Poor instrumentation, a misaligned uh, indirect, a scratch lens, always, this is the uh, a very common thing, you hold your lens against the light and you see so many scratches. Poor upkeep of the lens in the viewing mirrors and poor illumination. What are the clinical situations? The orbital and lay disorders, conjunctival conditions, poor pupillary dilatation, media opacities, post-trauma, post-cataract surgery. So orbital and lid disorders, sometimes very prominent orbital bones or deep set eyes, it's very difficult to uh, dip down and do the indirect. Small uh, palpable fissures, conjunctival conditions like chemosis, simliferon, it's very difficult to depress. Poor pupillary dilatation, when they're elder elderly diabetics, the pupil just won't dilate. Pilocarponized eyes, when they're posterior synechiae, Media opacity like corneal pathology, AC reaction, PCO, lenticular opacity, or vitreous haze. Post cataract surgery, when we have to see the uh, fundus, sometimes when there is a very small lexus, when there's PCO, the IOL edge defect, especially when you're doing indirect lasers, it is sometimes so difficult because the IOL uh, uh, glare effect comes into play and uh, the burns just won't come through, and poor pure dilatation post surgery. So this already has been uh, discussed. Uh, why, uh, what are the situations with when we do not depress? This is an important slide. Post PK or RK surgery, if there's a presence of bleb, presence of rubiosis or hyphema, a proliferative retinopathy in CNVM, you can always uh, 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 increase the chance of bleed, and sus uh, suspected glow perforation. If the patient comes with trauma, never depress. So post trauma, post periocular injection, and in the early post operative period, do not depress. Thank you so much for your patient hearing, and. Uh, now, can I re request yes. Dr. Sir, uh, Sandeep, please? Yes. You have not given the Sandeep's point, slide. Uh, should I do that? Or yeah. Okay. So one more thing is uh, when you are doing uh, the indirect ophthalmoscopy, you will see sometimes you see a lot of reflexes coming in between. And that is the simplest, sim the mo most common reason of this that I have seen is the, the doctor holding the lens in the opposite direction. So you just have to invert the lens and see and those reflexes will be gone. This is another very common mistake uh, the beginners do, uh, to hold the lens in the reverse direction. Right? So if you're seeing a lot of reflexes, just check your lens whether you're holding it properly or not. And when you are starting your practice, choose very easy patients, like high myope, young patients, cooperative patients, and always keep the patients, uh, at least four or five patients towards the end of your OPD, when you're a little free. And ma'am, especially uh, which you highlighted the importance of bleb, not to indent in cases of bleb. I remember once uh, during my fellowship days, the patient had uh, re visible sutures there, and we were doing PRP in a dark room, and we were not told that there was visible sutures. And while indenting, I released the suture, and the whole soft glow went soft. So these are very important points which we have to keep uh, while uh, doing yeah. uh, IO and doing PRPs. Yeah. In, in fact, in, in the presence of vitreous hemorrhage also, uh, you have to be very careful. 
uh, I remember when I was a fellow, uh, so we were not allowed to indent in patients who have vitreous hemorrhage because uh, uh, because when you're indenting and then you're releasing it suddenly, so the blood vessels that is bleeding may again bleed and cause uh, a recurrence of vitreous hemorrhage or increase in the vitreous hemorrhage. Mm. So if you have to indent in those eyes, uh, just take care, you press it slowly and then release it slowly. Post RK, you want to say? Pardon? Post RK RD. We cannot. We can. We do that. We can do that. So uh, I'll go on to color coding, which is very important. And uh, color coding and fundus drawing is very, very important part of indirect ophthalmoscopy. Uh, one of our esteemed teachers at Shankar Netale always used to give an example of uh, a situation when you are in Kashmir. Have you ever been to Kashmir, any of you? If you are in Kashmir and you are uh, uh, sitting in a boat in Dal Lake, you get a picture clicked and you come back and people say, what did you see? You can even sh see them, uh, show them the minutest details. Okay, there were the birds flying at this point, there were two snow-capped peaks, there was this shikara which was selling flowers. If you hadn't taken a picture, you would just remember that, okay, we went boating on the Dal, uh, uh, on the dal Lake, but the small minute details would be forgotten. So this is the importance of color coding and fundus drawing. When you're doing color coding, just remember that there are three, four basic colors. It's not a whole array of colors. Black is retinal or choroidal hyperpigmentation, intraocular foreign body, Brown, anything related to the choroid, choroidal detachment, pigment, melanoma, choroidal rupture. Blue is detached retina, subretinal fluid, retinal thickening. Red, when there's attached retina or any kind of retinal hemorrhage, like a pre-retinal or retinal hemorrhage, microaneurysms. Orange, elevated new vascularization. Purple, flat new vascularization. Anything inside the vitreous cavity is green, always, anything like a vitreous hemorrhage, CNVM, cotton wool spots, which are, pro which are protruding inside the vitreous cavity have to be shown green. Any fri fibrous proliferation, which is inside going inside the vitreous cavity is green. Yellow, any hard exudate, subretinal hem heme or active retino uh, chororetinitis. So this is the fundus drawing. You have to uh, uh, sh uh, draw the optic nerve head first uh, between the three and nine o'clock position. And then you draw uh, the, uh, trace the, uh, the retinal vessels starting from the optic disc from the posterior pole, uh, the major vessels, and th then how they branch out. You also have to draw the ora serrata uh, 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 and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the whole outline before you uh, mark in the details. So this is the fundus drawing, ma the macula on audi, which is shown red in color. This is a horseshoe tear, a retinal hole, retinal opaculum. Because the opaculum is in the vitreous cavity, it is green. This is uh, white without pressure, always blue, hatch lines. This is a lattice. Commonly, you have to draw it. It's blue with blue hatching. And if there's a hole inside, then it, has, it is drawn in red. This is the inner let retinal break. RD with PVR. Uh, of course, this is uh, uh, attached retina, su the superior uh, RD, and then the star fold. Uh, uh, that can be drawn in green. This is the total retinal detachment. The, hem uh, the hemorrhages. Subretinal hemorrhage, as I said, is yellow in color. Uh, boat shaped uh, subhyaloid hemorrhage, you can see. Vitreous hemorrhage, since it's in the vitreous cavity, it is green in color. And dot and blot hemorrhages are all red. This is the choroidal menoma in brown. And this is diabetic retinopathy. Always remember, there's no shortcut. Even till now, I always color code all my prescriptions. I have my color pencils and I draw all the, with all the colors. So uh, there is no shortcut, short, uh, shortcut in this. Choroiditis, active choroiditis has to be drawn blue, uh, uh, yellow. And choroidal vascular membrane, there are different uh, uh, levels of the, uh, you know, the membrane, so it has to be color coded ac accordingly. Subretinal fluid, as uh, everyone knows, has to be coded in blue. So that ends my talk. And uh, now I would like to uh, invite upon stage uh, our next speaker. The fundus drawing, what I say is like just an impressionist painting. You uh, know what is an impressionist painting? Th all those painters like Rembrandt or at that era or Michelangelo, they were all impressionist painters. What was there? There was no cameras at that time. 
so uh, they, they, they would see a scenery, they will just imprint in their mind and they will start drawing on that. And uh, then the photographs came and, and definitely the impressionists uh, become lesser and lesser. But nowadays the significance is that those impressionist paintings are sold at so, so much cost and the photographs have no value at all. So paintings and drawings, in, I must say the fundus drawings have a lot of lot, lots and lots of value even if we have those fundus cameras. Uh, I'll talk about this in my talk, uh, but I think uh, we should all know how to draw. Sorry. So let me invite upon stage Dr. Sangeet Mittal, who uh, uh, doesn't need any introduction. He's a very prolific VR surgeon in Chhind Eye Hospital, Jalandhar. And uh, I, th I always tell him that now you should have a room where you can keep all your, all your awards because every conference he collects at least three or four. So over to you, Dr. Sangeet. Thank you, Dr. Puja, for the kind introduction. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I've just started getting awards. We, <laughs> we it's, and I, I hope that in inspires everybody because I'm in private practice. I don't have that institutional backup. And if I can win an award, anybody can win an award. I can assure you all this. So it's just a matter of time, matter of focus that anybody can win that. So my topic for today is pre-operative fundus drawing and its significance. And all fundus drawings in this courtesy is done by my dear friend, Dr. Rajiv Gupta. Uh, what is a cartogram? Cartogram in Oxford Dictionary is a map on which statistical information is shown in diagrammatic form, right? So what we are doing is we are making a fundus cartogram. So the basically the chart, uh, as Dr. Puja has also told you, is the, that is used is the Amsler Du Bois chart and it has got uh, these three circles, right? The first, the first circle, the innermost circle is the equator, the second is the aura, and the last, uh, the yellow one is the junction of the pars plicata and the pars plana. And whatever uh, lesions you are seeing, you have to mark accordingly. And equator, uh, generally how we study the equator is we uh, use the vortex veins as one of the landmarks and uh, then we mark the equator accordingly, right? And beyond the equator is the post-equator lesions and, uh, uh, sorry, in, uh, posterior to the equator are the post-equatorial lesions and uh, the, the interior to the equator are interior and equatorial lesions. So this is a picture taken from the net only. And it's a cartogram of the retina with the universal color coding. And Dr. Puja has nicely pointed out the different uh, colors that we use for different lesions. Uh, black, he pointed out mostly for pigmented scars. Uh, anything, any pigment which, it, which is in the attached retina is to be drawn black, right? And any pigment which is in the detached retina is to be drawn brown. And brown can also be used for the choroidal detachments or choroidal melanomas uh, or the other choroidal lesions also. So universe, uh, for blue uh, solid uh, drawings for the retinal folds, the det uh, I think she has nicely covered all these things. I should skip these part. Yeah. So uh, one thing uh, as she mentioned was that uh, orientation is one of the biggest problems that we face while we are learning indirect ophthalmoscopy and you or keep your drawing chart always inverted on the patient's chart, chest. And this maneuver, what happens is it inverts the chart and you can draw the fundus as it appears in your condensing lens. So when you will again re, uh, re-invert the chart, you will, it will give you a better orientation. So I think we all used to follow this and uh, it, it is one of the best methods to make a good fundus drawing. Then each view, how you do you measure the distance uh, uh, from where do you have to draw the lesion? So each view in the condensing lens measures around eight disc diameters. So you take three uh, simultaneous views and you will reach the aura, right? So uh, this is how you can measure the distance, how far it is from the disc and how uh, you have to draw the lesion at that particular point. Similarly, those uh, lines in the Du Bois chart gives you clock hours, one to two, 12 clock hours, and uh, you have to point the lesion uh, to the precise location, uh, right? And you see, uh, if you are making a drawing here, you see 
you have made there's a, there's a nevus here so if, if a good drawing will tell you that this nevus is at one o'clock position right and it is about three disc diameter in size and it's six disc diameters away from the disc right so a good fundus drawing uh, will be able to give you this information so why, why is it uh, why there is a need for documentation so regardless of the form of the records that is electronic or paper records whatever you are keeping a good clinical record all keeps he keeping helps in diagnosis planning treatment and follow-up to enhance the communication between different healthcare professionals, you need good uh, standardized uh, drawings, right? Clinical records are also valuable documents to audit the quality of your healthcare services and research, right? Uh, many of us won't have those wide field cameras. So you won't get that wide uh, peripheral pictures. So you have to make good fundus drawings to keep a good record. And for uh, investigating the medical legal issues, uh, so one thing is always there which is not documented means you have not been the courts will not listen to you if you're not if you're documented they will if you're not documented they said you are not just seen this you're just now saying that this would have been done right so this is a prototype case uh, of uh, a retinal detachment surgery who had undergone vitectomy with oil and then sor and phaco and uh, just i'll just show how this record keeping helps so this is the first case sheet, the demographics and the case history you keep. And then a brief, when you are in the OPD, uh, you, you don't have time to make a full detailed drawing, just make a small drawing like this, right? Uh, just draw some uh, vessels, or even if you don't draw your vessels, just uh, uh, roughly estimate, okay, this is the area of the detachment and uh, here this small hemorrhage is there, or this is a lattice with the horseshoe tear. So in the OPD, you make a small uh, drawing, and uh, then when you are uh, decided that you are going to operate, then you make a detailed fundus drawing, right? Like uh, this is the same case and a proper fundus drawing being done before the uh, patient is taken up for surgery. Then, of course, the consent form is there, and vitals monitoring, and uh, so RD surgery needs also to be documented. And in the RD surgery sheet also, you make that small preoperative drawing and then uh, make whatever you have done properly on the uh, sh sheet, right? And then post-op again, similar uh, follow-up. So the drawing will help you uh, in following up the patient uh, very nicely, right? So the first and uh, most important uh, use of preoperative fundus drawing is to good keep a good clinical report which will help in diagnosis, planning treatment, and follow-up, right? And second is the to enhance communication with between different healthcare professionals. So if you, uh, if I want to say, if I want to take some second opinion, uh, I will ask that doctor, I have seen a patient who is a temporal retinal detachment, one o'clock to two o'clock or uh, particular hour, there's one horseshoe tear at, 12 o'clock, one at, so it becomes a lot of confusing. So if you have drawn that drawing and you just sent the drawing across, uh, it will be a better communication. Or just uh, if you show, uh, if you are, if you have made a drawing and you have to show it to your senior or to your professor, then uh, you just show the drawing and he'll understand what there is. Rather than you speaking one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, so making the things confusing, that will, uh, this uh, helps to communicate better. Right. It it does not mean that uh, those things doesn't ma don't don't doesn't matter. They also matter, but this is a better way of communication. Then clinical records are also valuable documents to audit the quality of healthcare services and research. When when you suppose you are doing some research and you need uh, there's one very uh, what we did was we did a primary uh, what we call the surgical pneumoretinopathy and we were trying to evaluate. Uh, are back uh, retrospectively some patients uh, and we didn't know how much tears were there in superiorly, how much were inferiorly and which patients had those tears. But when we looked at their drawings, we all the things were there. So it always helps us to analyze our records later on. Then again, for medical legal issues, that, as I told you, not documented is not. Mm -hmm. There are more uh, uses, the documentation or this funded drawings helps in our improving our observational skills because we draw what we see, right? 
so we observe those things and we draw uh, and and what we have learned is the more you draw the more you observe right and more lesions you will pick up slowly and slowly if you are making a proper drawing so it also helps in improving our observational skills and it gives better information even better than what fundus photograph sometimes gives you right uh, Though there is some limitations of uh, the Amsler Du Bois chart that we use, one of the uh, most important limitation is that the equator is actually the widest part of the eyes, right? And aura is smaller than equator. But what happens is in this circle, the aura becomes the largest part. So whatever lesions there are, they are almost doubled up in size. Right, so one thing always you have to keep in mind wh when you are doing the drawing, right? But still, you one look at this drawing and one look at this whole collage of fundus photos, which you, which you, I think this is much better way of uh, putting it through rather than it gives me gives me a better information. Uh, yeah, it also gives me uh, particular clock hours also where uh, where the lesions are. And it helps in planning of surgical steps, like in like this drawing. I know this is just one horseshoe tear here. Inferiorly, I'll just do a buckle here, and my problem will be solved. And it, it's very important decision making. So this this like this, uh, I can I'll do a buckle. I'll just go if my, even if my resident has drawn it, I'll just see that there is uh, there's a small horseshoe tear. I'll do a buckle here. I'll just see there's a small HST and it is following the link of rule and so I'll just do a vitrectomy with the from the break side. It. But if I, I see this kind of picture, so what I will plan is I'll plan even if with a smaller uh, uh, retinal detachment, I will plan a vitrectomy with encyclage because I know then there is a continuously ongoing process which will be keep uh, causing on more and more horseshoe tears later on. So I'd like to support the whole of the bitter space here, so I'll plan a vitrectomy with M. Fuxa. So a proper drawing also helps you in decision making. So uh, Linkoff's rules, uh, uh, so it also helps in location of prim uh, primary breaks. Uh, sometimes what happens is you are not able to see the breaks uh, preoperatively. So, uh, but if you have made a proper uh, drawing, you can estimate where the breaks would be. And intraoperative, when the patient is under anesthesia, you can better do examination and uh, look at the breaks. So there are various uh, link of rules. I won't go into the details of that. And one more uh, disadvantage of Amsler chart, Amsler Du Bois chart that we use is we cannot apply actually the link of rules to the Amsler Du Bois chart because link of rule uh, in uh, when you're applying the disk is always at the center of the chart, right? But in the Amsler chart, the disk is at one side and fovea is the center, right? So you don't apply blindly the Link of rules to that, and always keep that shift in mind, right? So again, it helps in visualization problems during surgery. Suppose uh, when you are operating, you have not made a drawing, and suddenly the pupil becomes small. There is a hypotonia, and suddenly you will just be lost. What to do now? But if you had made a drawing, you will know that okay, this lesion was here. You will be able to uh, cover up many things just because of the drawing itself. There's one example, I had one patient, I had done a pneumoretinopexy, it was a long time ago, uh, and uh, I, uh, I had done a pneumoretinopexy and the patient had endophthalmitis after that. Unfortunately, uh, we gave him the patient the intravitreal injection, and uh, because I knew that the break is at this position, and I just did a buckle in that place, and gave an intravitreal injection, and the patient res responded well to the intravitreal injection, and the buckle covered the uh, retinal detachment part of it. Otherwise, I'd had to give, uh, do a vitrectomy and other things for that patient. So uh, uh, it helps in visualization problems, even not even during surgery, after, even after surgery also. So this is one patient. Uh, uh, this patient had a, preoperatively, we knew that there, is a, there are breaks in the det attached retina also. Although this was a small detachment, we doing a vitrectomy here, we, there were two uh, horseshoe tears and we just flattened the retina and it nicely flattened and we did uh, cryo here. So if, we, if I had not had that preoperative drawing in my, my, in my uh, uh, mind, I would have, may have missed the uh, break that was in the attached retina. As you see, uh, 
So, but I had that pre-operative drawing in my hand. I knew that there was a break in the attached to retina, and so I, I was able to uh, cover that also. A small, uh, briefly, because uh, I wanted to include this, that what is the importance of proper fundus examination before cataract surgery? Because many cataract surgeons, we tend to miss doing a proper fundus examination uh, beforehand. So one, the most important is to avoid your visual surprises, to prevent retinal detachments, and to diagnose uh, any kind of lesions which can predispose the patient to retinal detachment post cataract surgery. Sometimes to maintain visualization and to choose compatible IOs if there are some uh, retinal problems, you have to choose compatible IOs, IOs and manage coexisting conditions like if there's cataract and diaptic retinopathy also to manage them. So you need to do a proper uh, fundus examination before cataract surgery. And avoid the uh, visual surprises. What are visual surprises? Many times we have seen cataract surgeons talking about the refractive sur surprises. Refractive surprises are refers to poor outcome due to post-op refractive error and can which can be corrected by either by changing the IOL or by doing a refractive surgery. But visual surprise refers to poor visual outcome due to a macular problems which are not detected preoperatively because the patient's fundus was not examined. And this cannot be corrected as macula cannot be exchanged, right? So to better safe than sorry, pre-existing condition becomes a complication if you miss a problem. Everyone will assume that the surgery caused it. Patient's expectations at this time are at all time high. Uh, small incision refractive cataract surgery, femto laser, wavefront technology, intraoperative abrometry, high end costly IOLs, marketing results in ex high expectations. And super patient expects that he'll get supervision after surgery. But, uh, pardon? Yes, yes. <laughs> so unhappy patient despite a flawless surgery and a perfect refractive outcome and having a macular problem will give you problems later on, right? So to conclude, precise documentation is essential for multiple reasons. Most importantly, accurate surgical planning. A detailed drawing improves our observational skills. The notes made during the drawing of a fundus can often provide more details than photography. And a cautious, thorough approach is appreciated by patients and it results in a happy patient despite poor visual outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, if anyone has any questions, we can, we are very, we'll be ha very happy to take them up over the next five minutes. Ma'am? focus there and then when I come back, uh, I Dr. Dr. Abhishek, would you like to? So even after decreasing the chlorine, it helps to do minimum <coughs> rehab training? Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's yeah. So I think, uh, Actually, I was going through these chlorinates uh, in, in the yeah, conference. Yeah, now I've seen that. So yeah. they go pretty down. So yeah. I don't think in like height should be a problem in your case. Yeah. So I think it's a little bit more of you need a little bit more practice to make it perfect. Uh, other than that, I don't see height. I think it's more of your mind block. That's okay. all. I also had this problem when I started. I, uh, my height was also very small <laughs> as compared to normal. And I also had the benches were too high. What I did was just cut the legs of that benches and just made them sit down <laughs> and adjust it. I think the best position is your waist height. The table should be your waist height. Yes. Yeah, and then you can uh, properly examine the tissue. Mm -hmm. And that also will not uh, strain your back also. Sir, how often practically that third circle helps uh, between aura and pass planar? No, I have never used it. <laughs> I have never used it. <laughs> pass planar, it's very difficult even to visualize. <laughs> it's so far anterior that if the patient is highly myopic, it's a different thing, but otherwise it's quite anterior. I have never used it myself. Actually, so. Choice of indenter, like which do you use? Uh, it actually, it all depends upon what you are comfortable with. Uh, in SN, we were used to, we were taught to use that thimble type of depressor. 
and in TJ, I was taught to use that rod type, uh, one side smaller, and so I am comfortable with many of them. But it's it's a matter of what you are comfortable with. Dr. Shivani, any tips when you are uh, examining ROP babies? Any indirect ophthalmoscopy tips? So the babies are more difficult to handle. But if we properly wrap the baby and give them a uh, five, 25 uh, dextrose uh, su to suck, the babies automatically they pacify and then you don't need to struggle with the baby. Mm -hmm. Basically, they are the uh, then they become the easier lot to uh, do the uh, IOs. But the most important thing to keep in mind is uh, the baby's eyes are a smaller eyes, so we don't need to indent to a deeper depth. We have to keep it anterior towards the limbus. So then we can uh, see, uh, we can uh, already see the uh, aura in those cases. And what length do you use? Uh, ideally, it should be 28B, but uh, we can uh, always accommodate according to the lenses available. And one more thing is you ask the parents to stay outside. Yeah. That, that is the most difficult thing to contain. The, <laughs> <Because it's laughs> uh, the mother starts crying uh, when they see the babies crying. So very necessary to pacify them and then keep them uh, waiting outside and tell them nothing is going to happen and that's the way proper counseling of the uh, mm. parents uh, and for ROP babies also we need to keep one thing in mind that uh, to move the eyes in various directions there is a different vectors kind of uh, indenters coming so we need to use them rather than the normal indenters so thank you everyone for this, uh, you know, uh, I hope that uh, our uh, limited span of one hour has incited some interest in you all mm -hmm. to uh, master the techniques of indirect ophthalmoscopy. And I believe me, uh, always uh, aim at buying the instrument. If you buy the instrument, then you'll be more motivated to learn. So uh, it it could be any any make. It could be it could be upper swami. It could be anything. But uh, always try to have an instrument which you buy. So, you know, then it will be make, make you more motivated to learn. And uh, the other things. Yeah, I, I must think, I must just last, I think this should be the com concluding remarks. Indirect ophthalmoscopy is just a matter of practice. So there's nothing much involved in it, right? So the more you practice, the more you'll get better, right? And everybody should go do indirect for thermoscopy. I always tell my residents, this is the second best thing you can do in dark. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll wrap up the session now.